Well, thank you very much for that kind invitation. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much also for coming out and giving up part of your Sunday to get involved with National Science Week. Let's have a big up for National Science Week. <laughs> The geeks will inherit the earth, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> We're heading into a world where robots will be an increasing, uh, of increasing importance part of our lives. This won't just have an impact on the future of work, but on the future of everything. What, it will, mean, what will it mean if robots are our toys, our pets, our friends, and even our partners? If robots can be everything from carers to warriors, what does this mean, not just for human lives, but for the way that we understand human intelligence, human values, and humanity itself? If we want technology to create a better future for people all over the world, what do we need to do right now to, st to make sure that we steer these extraordinary developments in the right direction and avoid a dystopian future? We have a brilliant panel to discuss these and many more uh, uh, issues that will come to light through Good Robot, Bad Robot, Life with Intelligent Machines. Haywon Park uh, is a research scientist at the, in the Personal Robots Group at MIT Media Lab. Toby Walsh is Professor of Artificial Intelligence at UNSW and author of books including It's Alive, Artificial Intelligence from the Logic Piano to Killer Robots and 2062, the world that AI made. And on the far side of the stage, we have Ellen Broad, Head of, Publ uh, of Policy at the Open Data Institute and author of Made by Humans, The AI Condition. Not bad for product placement, don't you think, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> I'd like you to please give an enormous hand to our panel this afternoon. This is uh, a Sydney Science Festival event, part of National Science Week. Get out there and have some fun, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and co-presented with the Sydney Opera House. And I am, as was so ably introduced, I'm Paul Willis, and I'll be your host for the afternoon. Uh, just a couple of quick bits of housekeeping. If you've got your mobile phone, uh, we do have a rule that if your phone goes off and disturbs everybody, uh, that's your sign that you want to buy a beer for everybody in the room. Ooh. So. I would advise you to switch your phone to silent and tweet the bejesus out of this, ladies and gentlemen. There's going to be some interesting ideas floating around, so why don't we make sure that they go out to the rest of the world? Um, we will be going, having a talk for about 50 minutes or so, and then we will be coming to you for your questions. So please get thinking, and uh, let's uh, have a, a lively Q&A session towards the end of the evening. Where to start? Let's go around the panel, starting with you, Haywon. Yeah. Um, is there a robot that you really, really, really want to see, <laughs> and why? <laughs> um, so I grew up watching, like many of you, all the animation and movies that had robots in it. Uh, what really intrigued me about the things that were in sci-fi were those robots who were autonomous versus a robot that humans pilot and like fight the bad guys. <laughs> um, so, well, so that's pinpoint one. I'd say uh, C-3PO or uh, <laughs> Rosie from Jetsons. Um, I mean, I get, I, get, I get these comments from the parents even more and more now that they want something like Rosie because it takes care of your house chores, but not only that, it actually knacks your children. <laughs> to behave better. Well, actually, Max Jason almost, but yeah. So um, I guess those type of robots. So would something be. subservient. <laughs> well, I would not like to use that word. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so definitely like a companion robot that we actually interact with in a daily basis. Um, but it has its own intelligence to make decisions and act upon its own. But most importantly, benefiting our lives. In how the way we want. How about you, Toby? What's, <laughs> what's the one robot you would really, really like to see? Well, I, I think I want the robots. There's going to be probably the last robot that's going to turn up, which is the house cleaning robot. Mm -hmm. Because that's actually one of the hardest things to get a robot that's to do. Crazy. <laughs> um, ironically, the, you know, there's this thing called Moravac's paradox. The easy things for humans are the hard things for robots, and the hard things for robots 
And the things that are easy for humans, we can pick up a towel or make a bed. All of us can do that easily, but it's actually one of the hardest right. things to get a robot to do. Whereas we can get a you know, robot to play the ancient Chinese game of Go or something like that very easily. So that's the robot I'd like, because it would take away those the terrible housekeeping work that, that keeps us from spending was, time uh, with our families. I was going to say, you want that robot not because it's kind of the pinnacle of a challenge for what a robot can be, but basically it gets you out of doing the housework. <laughs> no, I don't want to get out of doing the housework. I, I want everyone to be got, got out of doing the housework. <laughs> Egalitarian. Yeah. Um, Ellen, Ellen, your favourite robot. It's so interesting because I had variations on the same immediate thought. I thought of Rosie and I thought of house cleaning, <laughs> convenient robots as what, what systems can make my life easier mm -hmm. where at the moment I have to do tasks that are relatively low value for me but take up time. So I didn't immediately think of, say, a humanoid-like robot doing my cleaning for me, but I did think of if I had a robot that knew what was missing in my fridge right now, could tell me, could order it for me, could have it delivered to my house and restock the fridge so that when it came to cooking meals at night, everything was taken care of. That was where my brain immediately went. So it's interesting that we've all had variations on the same so a shopping utopia robot. of robots. <laughs> a shopping robot would be great. Grocery shopping is the bane of my life. The, the most popular robot on the planet today is the vacuum cleaning the vacuum Romba robot. Yeah. Well, that's so the only robot that can go in the house right now. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. And, and I think, uh, actually, uh, we, we'll keep coming back to the, the vacuum cleaner robot because it's, in many ways, it, it is that first domestic appliance that's become robotized and so familiar with us. And there's a, a number of issues machines? that will arise out of it. Washing machines, dishwashers. Yeah, yeah. Dryers. There's plenty of things that we can talk about. And, <laughs> uh, and in fact, that are robots. Uh, yeah, robots. yeah. But well, what I want to do now <laughs> is, is, Toby, can you just summarize where we are with robots at the moment? I mean, what can robots do at the moment and what do we want them to do? Well, I, th I think it's, it's partly like William Gibson says, which is the future's already there, but it's just a bit unevenly distributed. And so people don't realise quite how many robots there are. I mean, we have here in Australia the longest robot in the world, two and a half kilometres long. It's the autonomous train that takes coal out of the Pilbara. That's a robot. Um, we have the most um, automated ports in the world. We have these giant cranes. They're some of the tallest robots in the world that carry the containers off the ships and put them down on the, on the port. And, and everywhere you go, you actually bump into things. So if you go up to Sydney Airport and check in, there's these lines of robots. They don't, most people don't think of them as robots, but those check-in machines that scan your luggage and put the, the, you, the, the, you put the tag on, they're robots. They can sense the world. They've, they've got weighing scales they can think and, and act. lasers. But is, is there some think degree of automation I mean, that, that you step into the robot domain? I mean, you, we've automated tasks throughout history. Yes. But then what you're talking about is a certain level of automation whereby we, you can call them robots. It, yeah, you're, it, it's in some sense, I think there's a matter of degree, right? And I think the, the critical idea is the amount of autonomy the amount of independence the machine has mm -hmm. to act on its own. And increasingly, we're having machines that have more and more autonomy. And probably the first place that most of us will come across that is autonomous cars. That the machine will literally be able to say, take me home, and the machine will do everything else to decide how to do that and how to avoid everyone else. And that, that is profoundly different because now we have a new actor, saying that on a stage, new actor in our world, that is making decisions, some of which might be life or death. And that really is quite a different change for humanity to have this other thing out there that's making decisions, sometimes good decisions and sometimes perhaps bad decisions. Hey, Juan, it was interesting when we did that little, what's your favorite robot, what robot yes. you really want? It did come back to the idea of some form of, of service to, to people. Uh, what about the relationship side of it? How, do, how are we supposed to relate to, to things that were normally done or used mm -hmm. to be done by people? Mm -hmm. You had to relate to the house cleaner. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you see that we need to relate to our Roomba? So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so going back to the summary Toby just, Toby just gave, um, the, ro the definition of robot is very broad. 
right? It's not only the, the things that are had like f physical forms like this 200 kilometer train mm -hmm. that you just mentioned, but also people like to call AI generally robots because they can um, think, sense, think, and act, right? Um, but when we talk about relational robots that we can relate to, um, that's exactly the field I'm studying. So the social intelligence I'm studying is um, how can we give robots um, social, emotional, and relational intelligence? Um, because we find giving a intel relational intelligence to robots, it actually makes more a core benefit to the people when it comes to tasks that we need people to engage in or like sustain the use of this kind of social technology. Um, so I think the relationship we'll build with robots is dependent on what kind of relationship we want to build with robots. Right now, we want to compare it to existing relationships like our family, our, um, our pets or toys, um, but it will be a new kind of category of relationship we'll, we build, we'll be building with the social agents. Um, it can be anything that you want it to become. So for example, some people relate to their cars as their <laughs> lovers, right? It's very, very common that people do that. Um, they put names to their cars and they take care of the car as if it was like their child or their girlfriend or boyfriend. Um, but that was a kind of a new thing that came up when the cars became like our property, right? So robots will become something like that. It will become a new relationship that we will form with them. Some people will take the very geeky route and actually um, love, like, like create this like loving relationship with them. Um, but as, as, as this discussion will get on, I think the importance of like educating the public of what AI and robots can, can really do and can't do and what they really are, can they have emotions, those are the really good topics we need to start educating people and make sure we understand what this type of technology is. Is it bad behavior, though, not to say please or thank you to Google Home? Well, it's a wonderful behavior. <laughs> <laughs> so we should. We should, we should insist yes. on saying please or thank you. We should. It's not necessary, but yes. Well, we can make it necessary. Definitely. <laughs> Um, so that's really I can just imagine Google Home saying, excuse, excuse me, me. <laughs> till you say your please. I've turned the lights on for you. <laughs> What's, <laughs> ma What's the magic, the magic word? word? <laughs> exactly. Ellen. So that will just all the design, design, interesting design decisions. Uh -huh. mm. Mm. And, and, and uh, Ellen, there's a, another dimension to this discussion, and that's the ethical dimension, because the more that we provide autonomous thinking robots and devices, uh, just run us through some of the ethical minefield that we're walking into there. So I think it's always worth reflecting on why is it that we care about ethics in certain contexts or why is it that there are certain situations in which the ethical implications come to the fore and that's usually because they stand to affect our lives either in a very direct way, they could cause harm or benefit to humans or the behaviour impacts on humans in some way. So we talk about business ethics, um, being good so, uh, corporate citizens, uh, preventing pollution. There's kind of lots of different spheres of ethics, but I think at their core about um, how do you behave in situations mm -hmm. where the consequences of your decisions could impact on humans in some way, in, in quite like in a profound way. And... I, at the moment, we talk a lot about ethics in robots in terms of the ethical decisions they might have to make. So um, in autonomous vehicles, we quite often talk about the trolley problem mm -hmm. in the autonomous vehicle scenario. How is it that you teach uh, an autonomous system to make decisions in the instance of a collision about where to go, what to avoid? Uh, I'm also interested in the ethical implications for makers, designers of these systems. So. Um, it seems to me, uh, one of the things I'm really conscious of when we talk about designing ethics into machines is that what we think is ethical changes over time. It changes, it has changed throughout history. Things that were considered ethical 100 years ago may no longer be considered ethical today. Uh, Australia has a lot of history with this. It may or may not have once been considered ethical to remove children from their parents. Uh, if you believed that they were at risk in kind of scenarios where it was more related to the colour of their skin. Uh, we thought it was ethical to uh, sample tissue and blood without people's consent. So that, that, uh, that context of what is the decision 
I think, changes. So we need to be wary of how we think about that in a machine context. What we can talk about is the behaviour and accountability and the uh, uh, ways of holding the designers of systems to account. So what is it as a designer of an automated car you need to think about? <laughs> How do we assure ourselves that these systems are safe? How do we make transparent and accountable the decisions that you do make about how a car is going to react in a collision context. Uh, we're already seeing this emerge with semi-autonomous vehicles, issues around things like uh, who has access to the data about crashes in instances of emergencies. Tesla has been faster to release crash data to the press than to the owners of vehicles. So I, to me, when we talk about the ethical implications, there's one aspect which is, of course, well, how do you teach machines to make decisions, but the more uh, where I think we can tackle it a little bit more readily is, well, how do you hold the designers of systems to account? How do we ensure our, assure ourselves that the decisions that they're making in these contexts think about the consequences? And are, are we holding them to account? Do you think we are? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, so I, I don't think, I think uh, in the same way that if we look at other sectors, um, I talk a lot about uh, analogies like pharmaceuticals, that we moved from uh, scenarios in which you could sell essentially anything over the counter, bill it as curing cancer or diabetes, only for it to actually contain glycerin and high levels of alcohol, and you didn't have to demonstrate safety or transparency about your system, uh, its level of kind of uh, effectiveness. And I think we're at the beginning of that similar journey that we've been on in lots of other sectors of how do you move from experimentation and innovation to safety and assurance. That's, I think, where we're going now. And it's, uh, I find it interesting that uh, when we talk about um, the, the sort of onboard ethics yep. of a, an autonomous system, uh, that we're actually holding them up to a, a standard that humans can't perform. So the, the, the trolley problem uh, is always set for an artificial system uh, on a time scale that humans don't think through the logical consequences of what's going on. They react instinctively. And yet we're expecting artificial intelligence systems to behave differently. We should, we should. We, 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 they're machines and we can hold them to higher standards because they're machines. They, they, they don't have human failings, they will have better vision, faster reflexes, and so we should demand of them higher standards, not, not the lower standards. I mean, the interesting question there is, how much higher should we demand? I mean, if mm. cars will be much safer than humans, humans are terrible drivers. We, we drive when we're drunk, we drive when we're texting, we drive when we're tired, we're distracted. A thousand people will die in the roads of Australia next year caused by an idiot driving. And that will go away once we have autonomous cars. So, but the question is, you know, interesting question, which is one that society has to answer, is uh, how much safer do they have to be? I mean, there's a, there's a moral argument. There's, as soon as they are slightly safer, then we should ban all humans and only let cars drive. But I don't think we're going to be quite that radical. But, you know, should they be 10 times safer, 100 times safer? What should be the limit that we set? And that's a question as a society we have to be comfortable with. The question is also very interesting because when a human driver makes an accident, the driver is accountable for it. But when an autonomous car makes an accident, oh, is it the driver that didn't read the fine prints that, oh, you need to be aware of the, the traffic condition all the time, but just let the, the car be autonomous? Um, or should it be the maker of the vehicle that should be accountable for it? Right? Or because the then. Design of the software exactly. and you know, where does responsibility end up? Look, I think before we go any further, something that we need to reflect on is what exactly do we mean by intelligence and artificial intelligence? Because they are two completely different things, really. Um, I, so far as I can see it, artificial intelligence really only deals with a subset of processes of human intelligence. Is that, today. Is that to date? Today. Okay, so what we're talking about are machines that can execute algorithms really quickly, much faster than us. That's not 
Well, I, I'm not sure that that's being a bit mean to the machines. <laughs> right. We can play Go better than any human. The, the Chinese now call it a Go god. Alpha Go plays Go at a level, plays moves that we've never seen before, takes us places in the game that we just never knew. 2,000 years of but it, playing Go never revealed. But it's Go. still only operating by the rules that it's been taught. And it, 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 you know, uh, the, 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 one of the aspects of human intelligence is the crea uh, creativity and the ability, the ability to think beyond the rules. I could beat any computer at Go, because I'd just turn <laughs> the bloody thing off. And actually, Kissinger, there was an article, there was, there was an essay in The Atlantic recently by Kissinger where he talked about one of the things that humans will now do in response to AlphaGo is they have now know moves that they previously didn't know and it will yeah. change human gameplay, that ability so to innovate. There's a feedback innovate. loop there. Yeah. Yes, so you see this with chess. So 20 years ago, 1997, um, Deep Blue beat the Kasparov, the best player, chess player on the planet. That didn't stop chess. There are more chess professionals playing chess today, earning a living playing chess than ever. It's actually made the game more interesting. Mm. Amateurs now play much better amateur chess, because you can play against a computer that can teach you things that you know, humans wouldn't have the patience to do. Um, and equally, Go, AlphaGo is going to teach us new bits about the game of Go and new ways of playing things. So, so it's actually augmented us. I mean, one day I actually hope AI isn't artificial intelligence, but augmented intelligence, that we use it to do better than we can do on our own. But they do act very differently. There are definitely things, I mean, AlphaGo is a very good example. Because when, when the AlphaGo was playing against Lee Sedol, right, in Korea, um, what really happened in the background, well, there were thousands com of computers that were computing for AlphaGo. So that was what mega, mega bytes of watts that was the computers were using. But Lee Sedol's like, brain power was only using uh, like 0.001% of that power. Um, so, like these examples show, what artificial intelligence is really good at is if you feed in big data into it and finding a pattern and like learning to react to a given input, to given query, is what this artificial intelligence is really good at right now. Um, but if to, for it to get to a human level of intelligence where humans are really good at adapting to things or learning new things that is completely different from their experience, is there still so much things have to happen for an AI to keep up with the human level intelligence? Can we see that artificial intelligence will progress to, instead of just simply using the algorithms and executing them incredibly quickly and that therefore coming up with novel ways of, of playing within the rules, will it take the next step where they will start to be able to Creating. modify their rules? or create their rules, or even break their rules in execution. That, I would think, would be a, a quantum leap in artificial intelligence. I, I don't think there's any reason to suppose that's impossible. I mean, you're breaking rules but itself... E even so, you, you seem teach, hesitant on that. You can teach people to be more creative. There are things you can do to be, make yourself more creative, and you, those are things that you... you know, there's a field of, of, of AI called computational creativity trying to... Mm. Try, not very well, today at least, trying to teach machines to be a bit more creative, to, to break the rules. And there are, there are things that you can do to make yourself more creative. You can do those things in computers as well. So what about um, emotions and uh, other qualities of human intelligence? Can we think that an artificial system would... Can you write an, uh, an algorithm for love? So I think in some ways we write algorithms to reflect love or re as in we, we design matchmaking algorithms that try to match like with like human. Uh, we know that we have algorithms writing poetry, uh, not necessarily very good poetry, but we can mimic and uh, a lot of the techniques that we're using which involve learning from large amounts of data to either mimic human behaviour or learn from it or to cluster like with like to look for patterns that are like other patterns in, in the context of matchmaking. Um, where I th what I think the hard question to answer is, is when a machine is, will have emotional intelligence equivalent to a human, so when we don't have one definition of what love is in a human, like we don't, there is no objective linear way of measuring love for us to know when we have designed a machine that demonstrate it in all of the many uh, 
representations of what love means, it is more likely that we'll think about it in contexts like Google Duplex, where does it mimic a human enough that you are fooled into thinking that it's a human? Um, and, or where, where we, that's all that matters for us. Heywon was talking about the relationships we have with our cars, with our pets. There are people for whom their relationships with uh, a system that is capable of expressing a kind of love will be love for them. Can we but, just, can but, we just, but, but, uh, computers don't have any chemical basis, right? So they're, they're yeah. electrical devices, and, yeah. and and it's clear that love has a biochemical basis mm. within it. You know, there are hormonal. God changes. bless dopamine. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you know, we could make a computer fake it. Is that the same as? Is that, yeah, the same? Say, is that exactly. ever going to be the same thing, or, or is there ultimately it's not the same thing. a biochemical? Without that biochemistry, are we? Are, is it never going to be the same? Well, well the question then becomes. Uh, we can design a computer to mimic love, mm -hmm. but can we design a computer that actually experiences love? And what do we mean by experiencing? So there's a movie called Blade Runner. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so like you said, as a person who is, like I say, I'm, I'm building em emotional intelligence for robots, um, what, what the AI can right now do is um, recognize humans' emotions using the cues that people output, your facial expressions, um, even using your physiological data that we can grasp from various sensors we can put on your body. Um, but then what we call emotional intelligence for robots right now is for a robot to take actions based on the sensing of your emotion, taking an action so that you believe, you, the robot makes the person believe that the robot is having this kind of emotion or this kind of belief or behavior. Right, so I'm working on, for example, a robot that demonstrates procurious behavior or growth mindset behavior to, to inflict beneficial influence to children because children's mirror neuron uh, lights up when they're interacting with a social robot like that has a physical embodiment. Um, and what the robot is actually doing is sensing the current mental state of the child but then also deciding what kind of action it should take to bring that child to a certain curious level or growth mindset level, right? So it's actually the algorithm thinking of making the robot take actions that will make the person interacting with the robot believe that the robot has a certain mental state. So it's not very different from a robot actually having curiosity or robot actually having growth mm -hmm. mindset or love. But since we're talking about bad robots, isn't this the, the problem is that humans are terribly gullible? <laughs> and we're going to be terribly yes. deceived into thinking the machines have more emotions and more love for us than they do and all Well, these other I don't things. think it's deceiving. We need to make sure that people understand. We what deceive these ourselves. Are. Exactly, exactly. We're deceiving ourselves, exactly. Um, but that's like the benefit of this kind of social technology, because then using that response and the behavior of humans we can make them um, change their lifestyle in a way that will better them, right? But we'll, we need to also be aware that if we can make positive changes, we can, it also means that we can make negative influence, right? The Facebook moment. <laughs> Facebook moment. Um, so for example, for the gross mindset study, so gross mindset is a um, big psychological term that Carol Dweck at Stanford came up with that she studied a lot on uh, what influence like parents and teachers make in their children's belief about their own ability, right? So if you're commenting on their result, like, oh, you're a genius because you're an A, it will inflict the child having a fixed mindset because in reverse, when the child doesn't get an A score, then in reverse, they will think that, oh, I'm not a genius or I'm not smart. Uh, but basically, so, so when I was piloting this study, I had a condition that the robot was behaving in a growth mindset-oriented way, in a fixed mindset-oriented way. And the result was just so scary because children actually picked up after the fixed mindset was behavior much more quicker than children in the growth mindset condition. So if the robot was saying, oh, this, child, this puzzle is too hard, I'm not gonna try it, they'll pick that up so quickly and they'll avoid challenges. So we had to revise the, the study design so that we don't, we take away the fixed mindset condition, but then put like a, just a neutral mindset condition to compare it to a growth mindset condition. So we need to be very aware of our decisions we make into designing these things. And like Ellen pointed out, it'll be a design guideline, like ethical design guideline, that we'll have to create for building these AI machines. If the uh, part of the problem of discussing artificial emotions is that it's 
difficult enough to define what emotions are in ourselves, then the next step to consider artificial consciousness and self-awareness, I still think we're scrabbling to figure out what consciousness is in ourselves. But is it possible that in the future we could be looking at a self-aware artificial intelligence? I think it's possible that we'll believe it. We can design something that can fake the Turing test. Uh, Turing well, test. I, I think it goes to the points both Toby and Heywan were making that, uh, you know, to Toby's point that we are gullible and we uh, believe certain things quite easily and quickly, and to Heywan's point that the way in which a system interacts with us either leads us in one direction or in another, so it can lead us to the fixed mindset um, that we kind of buy into quickly or a growth mindset. And I think that if we, you know, as Toby has said, how would we know what self-awareness is in order to say, yes, a machine has achieved it, it's more likely that it will resemble, it will imitate something that looks like self-awareness to us or to a certain, to, to enough people to believe that it has self-awareness. I don't know that we can objectively, there's no criteria as far as I can tell for what self-awareness is for us to say, yes, it's done it. I compute, therefore I am. Do you think well, there is some measure of doing this? <laughs> can you tell her goes soon. I, I don't know that you're conscious, right? I mean, consciousness is uh, probably... Most the, of the time, I'm not, actually. <laughs> it's it's pr probably, the, you know, the biggest unknown scientific question out there. We have, we have no meter to measure consciousness. We have no idea. You, your biologicals, you're yeah, acting in a way like I am, so I guess you're conscious. So if we have these artificial intelligence and they, they, they be act in that way, how are we ever going to know? But it's, I mean, that's one reason why AI is such a fascinating, profound subject to study, because it will tell us something profound about ourselves. The fact that, you know, when you woke up this morning, you became conscious. It's the most important thing to your existence, to you fall asleep unconscious again tonight. And yet we have no idea what it is. Where, where does that consciousness reside? What is it the consequence of? We have no idea. And so it's impossible to know whether we'll ever build that in silicon or anything else. And because it's such an unknown to us. And it will really tell us something about our own existence as much as about the existence of these interesting machines. It's intriguing that so much effort is put in with robots into creating them in our own image. The amount of work that goes into uh, creating a bipedal robot when it's possibly the worst form of locomotion you could choose. <laughs> Why do we want a bipedal robot? Because we're bipedal and our robots are going to be able to walk well, on two it's, legs. It's not only that. Um, it's not only that, because uh, well, people who are working on bipedal robots, they think like legged robots are, I mean, the, the infrastructure in our world is built for humans, um, therefore it's built for legged organics, right? So all the, the stairs, for example, like it's really hard for like, a wheeled or caterpillar robots to climb the stairs, but a lot of the infrastructure in our world is built for humans, therefore it's built for uh, a legged being. So that's why also, um, especially people working on locomotion, they are fixated on bike. But, but even a four-legged creature or a six-legged creature has right. an advantage over a bipedal right, right, creature right. in virtually every environment, including environments that are built for bipedal creatures. Mm -hmm. you know, um, but the, the whole point about you know, robots in our own image, artificial intelligence after our own form of uh, human intelligence, is that a large part of us is subjective. A large part of us is riddled with all kinds of weird biases. Can they, should they, also be engineered into artificial intelligence and into robots? Do we need to create perfect robots or do we need to make them a little more like us and make them imperfect? So That's I, a really interesting point, yeah. I don't know that perfect exists. And so at the moment we talk about systems learning from data to make decisions, what they have is data from humans, whether that's collected from um, systems, but still those systems are designed by humans who design uh, how they measure whatever observation of the world they're recording, or whether it's, for example, teaching a robot to speak based on recorded voices or um, corpuses of text. What they have is data from us and data about the world as it is. 
And so I don't know how we avoid uh, oh, perfect. being imperfect. Um, there are certain contexts in which we will go as close to perfect and perfect can be measured quite rationally and objectively, like if we talk about safety standards in autonomous vehicles. If you can remove some of the distractions that are what cause human crashes, like alcohol, texting while driving, those, those are things that you can remove in a system. When we start to talk about the kinds of machines that make decisions about who gets a loan, or who yeah, goes to prison. They will be much more perfect than us, though. So, for example, if we go back to autonomous cars, they'll be able to see in wavelengths that we don't see. So they, at night, they won't have accidents because they can use radar to see. They'll, they'll be able to compute um, the Newtonian physics much more accurately than us. They'll be able to compute probabilities much more accurately than us. So ultimately, they, they have the potential to make much better decisions than we do. In, autonom in, in those const contexts, I absolutely agree. I think where we can end up uh, overlooking or misjudging inaccuracies is when we start to apply them in other contexts, like who gets a home loan, who goes to prison, because we, we, those we, we, are not we, we as easy We make terrible measure. decisions as humans. I'm going to be provocative. And that's what they learn from. But uh, because we're full of all these biases, not many of which that we're unaware of, yep. and, and we don't make decisions based on evidence. We make them based on gut and in instinct, and we're terribly wrong. Yes. And so actually there is the potential ultimately, to actually eliminate some of these biases that, that humans make, th having machines make them. And should we do that? Should we try and eliminate those biases? Because it's those biases that are, is part of the thing that make us human. So if we want robots and we want artificial intelligences to be more human-like... But if we want equality in our society, if we want people not to be discriminated against, then should we allow... Should we allow, I'm going to ask a provocative question of the rest of the panel here, should we allow machines to make better decisions where they can? Which brings up that interesting example uh, from a few years back where they released a, a Twitter bot that could learn mm. from Twitter. Yes, and they had to shut it down in 24 hours because 16 hours, it learned to be the most bigoted, racist, horrible yes. Twitter account yes. on the planet. Yeah. Uh, some people say he's gone on to actually uh, become President of the United States. But nonetheless... <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, you know, uh, there, there is a, there is a Twitter If they block. want to learn from us, surely we should be thinking very carefully about what it is. What? Yes. There is, a, there is a Twitter prop bot that was trained on Trump's uh, tweets. Yes. Deep Trump, yes. Um, that's the, the German original name of Trump. Uh, and it is, it is, you can't tell it apart from the real thing. Spelling mistakes a lot. Spelling mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. trained on, it, on his speeches. And so it's, it's, you, can, you can see the word and it'll create... It passes like the Turing test Trump's for Trump. State. Yeah. That's not a very high level. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> We've certainly lowered the standards on the, uh, the, the, so the Turing test. <laughs> yeah, so there are different domains that uh, like bias should be removed, um, actually. But there are good domains that we want robots to show imperfection. So we did a recent like study on... Because I work a lot with for like child robot interaction, especially for education. Um, and we, we are placing these robots, we want to create that relationship as like a co-learning cool peer. So the children perceive the robot as a friend. So a friend is, should be imperfect, right? So, mm. And we were actually building this personalization algorithm for every child so the robot can learn what, what, what role it should take at a given moment while the, the robot is interacting with the child. To, to better engage the child. Like for example, if the robot is like a perfect like, expert in doing this task and the robot wins every time and finds everything in a perfect manner, then the child will not get a chance and lose interest. Or if the robot is based on a novice role and will ask the child to help out every step of the things, then child might as, as lose interest as well. But what if the robot is clever at choosing its role at the given moment, based on also based on learning from this child's personality? Um, can the robot actually choose a challenging role or a competitive role at the given moment? And we actually made a personalized algorithm that adapts to each child, and it actually had a really great effect on engaging the child in an educational activity, like learning vocabulary words or things like that. So there are definite benefit of making robots imperfect and actually show, demonstrate that imperfection. We've talked about uh, good robots. Let's <laughs> have a think about the bad robots. Where, where shouldn't we go with developing robots and artificial intelligence? Says Stephen Hawking, right, that uh, it's possibly the greatest threat to humanity. 
Uh, and, and, I mean, we're already weaponizing drones and doing all sorts of what look like very bad ideas to me. So what, 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 are, what does a bad robot look like to you, Toby? It's, it, it's, first of all, it's not the greatest threat to humanity. There was a survey done of 50 Nobel laureates, and it didn't even make the top 10 AI. There was, <laughs> climate change was right at yeah, the climate top. Change. Terrorism, mm -hmm. uh, ignorance, <laughs> um, the growing inequality in our society, all of those were much higher, much more immediate, much more pressing problems. It's not something that we can completely discount. But, but the 50 should. Nobel laureates doesn't get the same sort of coverage as Stephen Hawking. No, unfortunately not. <laughs> um, but, but we, should, we should be worried about some places that we're, we're letting AI be used. And uh, something that I'm very passionate about is, is the, the way it's being used, uh, being in, going to be introduced into warfare. And that will make warfare a terrible thing. Um, and there are... Uh, not that it's a particularly good thing at the moment. It why, make it why, more, why is it going to it make, it, make it, it a much more how terrible would it make it, thing? How would it make it worse? It will, ter it will terribly destabilise the world because we'll have these cheap robots that anyone can get the whole time. We, we already saw a week ago someone try and assassinate the president of Venezuela with a drone. It's going to be that's only the beginnings of what we're going to see in terms of this technology being used increasingly to change the, the, the geopolitical balance of power. It's going to change the speed, the accuracy, the duration of war in a very bad way. It's going to be um, the next weapon of mass destruction. What do you think is the, the bad robot that we shouldn't go anywhere near? So I think about the more humdrum kinds of robots that we build today. To Toby's point about some of the decisions we make as humans that are horribly biased. So I write a lot about um, using pr probabilistic systems to make decisions about humans, like who gets a home loan, who gets a job, who is sent to prison. Um, and we know that human decision makers historically have many biases. We fail to properly consider evidence. We, we have no um, easy heuristics for weighing it objectively. Quite often, the picture we have of individuals is limited at best. Unfortunately, at the moment when we look at a lot of probabilistic systems, that is the data they have to learn from, is however many instances of human decision making. So in the sentencing context, you have a data set of offenders whose existence in that data set reflects certain lived realities of their interactions with humans. Um, so I wonder, um, someone asked this question at an event earlier this week, um, will we, is this inevitable? Is, will we start using probabilistic systems in these kinds of decision-making contexts? And I actually wonder if, so, so when I think bad robot, robot I think that is bad, because it's just picking up the worst of our tendencies without learning anything different. We may re... So I don't think we'll necessarily design a probabilistic system, a system that's learning from data to make inferences or identify um, clusters of like patterns in data using the techniques we have now. We'll redesign the system so that can't be taken account of. So for example, there are... Um, companies now working in job recruitment where their model is not machine learning over thousands of CVs to identify the best kinds of candidates and then matching the CVs that are given in jobs with the candidates that have been identified as the best. They automate to remove certain information from categories of the hiring process, but the, what they have done is they've removed CVs as an input for human decision-making. So they've gone, well, what are some of the really problematic decisions that we know humans make and what are our problematic data sets? We'll stop using CVs as a data set for measuring competency. We'll set up a model which it's three problem-based questions. We use, we automate the collection of that information, the sorting of that information, the removal of certain characteristics associated with that, but we'll still have human decision makers, reviewers, looking at that data and actually assessing the kinds of candidates that they want, um, rather than moving to full automation. So I think that's an example where they haven't gone with a wholly probabilistic approach. They are automating where it actually improves, not only in terms of efficiency, but reducing some of those low-hanging human biases that we know about. Um, while still keeping diversity in the, in the decision-making sphere where you want it and need it, rather than embedding one 
viewpoint in a machine and scaling it across all of your applicants, you still retain some diversity of views at that decision-making point. Mm. Hey, Ron, what's your uh, bad robot that you don't want to see eventuate? Yeah, so I think the point is that there will be no pure bad robots, mm. right? <laughs> If there's a bad side, oh, I'm bad thinking side. of a couple of beauties. Yeah. So even even the the autonomous lethal weapons, right? It could be viewed as oh, it's going to save our soldiers' lives because we don't have to send our deploy our soldiers to this disastrous. That's places. that's a terribly one-sided view. The fact exactly. that these weapons will be turned against uh, eventually will be turned against exactly, us. Exactly, right? So to think that we're not going to be on the receiving end of these robots is, is, is completely misguided. Yeah, but it's so I think her point that they're not fully bad, as in there is well, an no, argument. There's nothing right about giving a machine the right to kill people. Right, so um, the thing is, it'll be very hard to differentiate because there will be people who think, oh, well, but like for, for, for our country, we'll benefit from these, these so-called like bad robots. So it's really hard because there will be, in my perspective, there'll be no pure bad robots. Um, and like Ellen mentioned, the things that I'm very interested in is the fairness of data that will actually be developing these um, biases and algorithms. So like how do we build a system that we can actually monitor this new type of AI algorithms that we, how can we monitor them so that they are fair um, and they are less biased than, than how, so when, how humans are. Um, so those are the points that I think we should, should start actually educating our younger generations, right? Like how can we make AI? Because now we are living in a society of AI. Now the kids nowadays are not only digital natives, they're AI natives. So how can we make them learn um, how to build these fair AI systems? Also think about the consequences the AI systems that we build will bring, right? And not only few giant companies owned the technologies to build these crazy AI systems. And the impacts on society of the rollout of robots and artificial intelligence, it goes beyond we can replace factory workers uh, with robots, we can replace lawyers. This has got to be a good move. We can replace lawyers <laughs> with robots. So I'm lawyers. a big fan of that one. Uh -huh. <laughs> but but it, it's not just the simple fact of taking work away from people. It's that the economic impacts of that flows through the whole mm. economy. So should, is Bill Gates right? Should we start taxing robots on personal income tax? Uh, and what uh, influence do we have through the economy? How are we going to adjust if we've got all these unemployed humans that are unemployable because there's robots doing their jobs? So I think it goes back to your original kind of opening question and discussion on how do you define robot? Because if we talk about it in the context that Toby talked about it in the beginning of you know um, systems that have automated particular tasks, then we're already in this world and we are having discussions about, you know, when I think of those contexts, now I'm thinking of your uh, Deliveroo's, your Ubers, your Amazon distribution network, where you have uh, large companies. When we say, should robots pay taxes, a robot doesn't have money to pay taxes. It's will the manufacturer or designer of that system, how do they contribute? Um, what does it mean for the uh, conditions that humans have? I don't necessarily foresee a future in which we'll see just job loss. Um, lawyers will definitely find new work for themselves to do, deciding how to regulate the systems. <laughs> oh, I but thought they were otherwise unemployable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it will be in the that where you can automate, where it is easier for a machine to do something than a human can, like check you in at the airport or take your bags from baggage drop through to the plane or drive the train. Those are like blue collar jobs. Uh, and you see humans being pushed more and more into whatever bit a robot can't yet do. So in the like, deliveries model, that's get on the bike or the moped and get the food from one place to another. But what are you paid for that? What are the conditions like for you as a human in that environment? Uh, how do we value that kind of work? 
Yeah, and, and do the companies pay taxes? I think that's really crucial. When Bill Gates is talking about robots paying taxes, I'm like, does he really mean will Microsoft pay more tax? Yeah, well, uh, we will be going to questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in, in just a moment. Uh, if you have a question, I believe that there are two microphones uh, either side. Are there? Is that correct? Yes, if you can make your way over. Uh, I, I think that's why that number one is coming down the side there. <laughs> If you have a question, if you could please... Oh, number two's over here. <laughs> if you can make your way to those microphones, we'll get to your questions in just a moment. There's no the, shortage. The, the, there's never going to be any shortage of work. Mm. There's, lots, there's lots of stuff we do in society that, that doesn't get properly rewarded today. It's called housework. It's called voluntary work. It's called education. It's, it's called looking after the aged. None of that's going to go away, and we don't want robots to do that. We want humans to do that. Because but what you're describing is, the, is the, the capitalist dream of an increase in productivity without yes. an increase in uh, capital so, costs. So in fact, a decrease it's, in it's capital costs. It's a distribution costs. problem of how do we share that prosperity. Well, exactly. the robots will be taking the sweat. We can focus on the things that are important to us and to our society and to our humanity. And then do we have to work out how do we distribute that wealth, that prosperity, so that all of us benefit? So in an ideal world, what we want is robots actually taking our jobs, right? Yeah. Doing, doing, doing works for us. And then we get to spend our time in a more meaningful, humanistic way. Um, but that, in a current capitalist structure is hard. So that's why the distribution of wealth should be reformed. Because right now, wh who will actually benefit from replacing human labor are the companies, mm. are the industries. Or the owners of the companies. Mm. Exactly. Mm. So work, work is the only truly obscene four-letter word. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that thought, I think we better go to an audience question. Ladies and gentlemen, sure. please refrain from four-letter words in your questions. <laughs> uh, do we have a question over at number one, please? Yes, hi. Um, uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, Daniel Dennett's idea of a sort of theory of mind, I know that's uh, being incorporated into human-robot interaction. How close do you think we are to actually being able to just set uh, robots and AI to learn in the same way humans do? Uh, who wants to grab that one? Hey, oh, you're, you're, I'll take you're a step. nodding sagely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, I, I couldn't really figure out where the question was coming from. But, um, <laughs> over there. Over, there. over okay. in the dark, so, yeah. There. Um, so the, the reason, we, reason, for example, in my research, we are building robots to recognize humans' like, cues better and also developing robot ex expressions so that humans can intuitively understand the robot's mindset um, is because, um, like, for task, for example, especially for examples like education or elder care, um, those are the domains where people want uh, these AI to be more relational. It's according to our study that people actually want AI to be more relating to them. Um, and it actually brings the quality of care higher. Um, so like we don't, for example, like elders, yes, we want to, so the work I do for the elder care domain is um, a, a, in addition to the daily care, like the medical reminders it can do, I also want to create robots that can connect human to human, right? So to, they still feel included in their community. Um, but like how to do that? Like, yes, we have FaceTime, right? FaceTime will solve that problem, right? But it actually doesn't because um, face, they, like the things that they have to use their mobile phones for, um, their technological access to these devices, the latest devices, are not so great. Um, so if they can use the robots that can actually act like humans, more like humans, then they can just intuitively use their normal human social cues, then they, their usage of technology and their, their benefiting of this technology significantly rises. And for any kind of robots, because now the robots are moving away from factories and actually coming into our domains where we share space with them, they need to abide to our social norms and social rules. Right? So that's the reason we need social intelligence for these artificial agents. I, I'll give a very precise answer. 2062. That's why my <laughs> book was called 2062. It's when machines will be as capable as humans. And you will be, uh, the, they will be available for sale outside uh, <laughs> at, at the end and, and also for signings. Um, let's move to a question from microphone number two. Uh, thank you. Um, so I guess this is building on the previous question and the talk of... <coughs> AI and like the, uh, a simulated brain, if you will, like true artificial intelligence. Um, and we've, I've heard the 
Board talk a lot about service and robots being tools for humans or extensions of their skills. But um, we haven't heard much discussion about the ethical implications that there are to do with if a robot is, at least for all intents and purposes, just as alive as a human is, should they receive the same, if not greater, rights than humans? And more so, if robots become better than humans in a, some measure, do humans even need to exist? <laughs> Deep. <laughs> um, it sounds like the Crichton question. <laughs> so I think there's some foundational questions that we've touched on in the panel around, well, how do you decide when a robot is sentient or thinking, has consciousness, to a point where whether they have rights or should have rights becomes a serious discussion. And we are not any even close to that. And my thought just in relation to rights is it always makes me a little uneasy the ease with which we go to when and should robots have rights when the matter of what our rights are is still such a complex and nuanced and difficult discussion for humans to have. And so a part of me fears a little bit what it says about us and what we're learning about ourselves if it's easier to contemplate what rights robots should have than how we interact with each other. So I think, number one, we're not yet at a point to even assess um, consciousness or sentience in that sense to kind of think about having rights. But it will teach us about ourselves and what we're willing to put up with from each other and how we're prepared to treat each other and how differently or similarly we see robots within that relationship. It just has always made me uneasy. If, if we're lucky, they won't ever be conscious or sentient, and then we won't ever have to give them rights. If we're unlucky, they will. So that's what I think. Like and, and, th and then we'll have that really difficult question. And we already have that discussion in society about, you know, should the apes um, be given personhood? Um, we already give, you know, certain rights to, to mammals and even some invertebrates, like um, squid, because they, are, they do seem to suffer. And so if they have consciousness, they will suffer. And then we probably should give the rights. If only we had Peter Dutton here to comment on giving citizenship to robots. Yes. Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> Microphone number one. Hi. I guess this kind of extends quite well on the previous question, but if we're talking about robot rights and all that kind of thing, I know Toby's got a pretty set mindset on um, robots in battle and in war fronts, but if we're removing all people from that kind of warfare and robots are killing robots, do we have to... Are robots actually bad then, and is what they're doing bad if they're not alive or they don't have rights? If they're killing each other, isn't that a good thing? I'd challenge the panel to think about well, that. The, 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 I mean, this is one of the interesting objections to the idea of, of uh, you know, autonomous weapons, killer robots. We'll just have robots fight robots. But sadly, that's not how warfare is fought. It's fought in towns and cities. It's, for, it's increasingly wars of terror. The history of warfare the last 100 years has been increasingly uh, total war inflicted on human populations. And that's what will happen with these weapons. If it was just robots fighting robots, then we could just say, well, why bother even with the robots fighting? We'll just decide it by a game of chess. Um, <laughs> the people, unfortunately, who we end up fighting wars with are not going to subscribe to those sorts of values. Um, so it would be nice to just say we could get humans out of the battlefield. I think, unfortunately, sadly, one has to be pragmatic, say that's not so how it's going to happen. These are going to be terrible weapons used against humans. I mean, and, and semi-autonomous weapons have been used against humans already yes. for the last, you know, we, we talk about drone strikes drone being strikes. used extra-territorially and what that means or doesn't mean in these contexts, but we're already in it. We're already using semi-autonomous systems to... It is, but that doesn't mean we can't regulate it. We've always regulated technology, um, mm -hmm. normally after the event. We re regulated biological weapons after the event, chemical weapons after we... That's the thing that really worries me, is that we'll have to see the horrors of such warfare, like we had to see the horrors of chemical warfare in the First World War, before, we, we, before we're repulsed by it and decide, actually, no, that's something that, where we shouldn't take the technology. Because with respect to drones, there's uh, been a really interesting development in that the operators, the remote operators, 
of suffering post-traumatic stress at the same rate disorder, as, real, yeah. as, as if they'd been on the battlefield yes. uh, in person. Uh, and the, what worries me there is uh, if I know anything about the mindset of the defence planners, it'll be, well, how do we take the human operator out of that system? Yes, mm. it, it's... It, it's, it's a, I mean, there's a huge, great military ab 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 advantage to doing that, right? You take the, the, you can scale your operations much better. You take the human out who gets traumatized, and then you have to deal with all the consequences of that. And then also, you eliminate the radio link, which is the the weak link. They, they've, they've brought down drones because of the radio link. So if the thing makes its own decisions, then it's a much more competent weapon. And you should be worried when people talk about weapons being much more competent. Microphone number two. Thank you. Um, one of the things I noted is that almost every uh, example of a robot that's been discussed by the panel today has been uh, basically a commercial product put together by a private company. Um, even when we start talking about uh, military drones, you start getting into military industrial complex. They were not products that were developed by the government themselves. Um, I guess my question is, how do you approach the idea that robots realistically will be produced as commercial products uh, with the driver that uh, they will need to be commercially viable to get to the market. I mean, um, two of the members of the panel are from universities and they're universities studying robots and artificial intelligence, but those are not the avenues by which robots will make it into society. Um, how do you see that as being... Uh, as influencing how robots develop as part of society. The commercial imperative in robot <laughs> development. So one of the worrying trends in some of the systems that I was talking about, so moving to automating decisions about humans, is that quite often they are built by private companies. They are proprietary algorithms. Uh, one of the most famous examples is the North Point Compass algorithm, which is a sentencing algorithm designed by a private company. And that because they are proprietary, then the language of trade secret supplies, the language of corporate intellectual property, and the, that what might otherwise be a different discussion to be had in a university context or a government context around, um, uh, open, you know, whether it's in the university context, open science, or in the government context, administrative law and principles of decision making, that's not followed through in the commercial context. We have massive problems uh, un unpicking and understanding these proprietary systems because they are designed by private companies. And in those settings, that is a real shift because a lot of the decisions that I spend a lot of time researching and investigating are the, they're, they're typically government or quasi-government interactions that a human has with a decision maker or with an institution that is central to their ability to access something. So uh, I think of, we're going to have to start talking about regulation. We're going to start talking about accountability when you're a corporate uh, commercial designer of a system. Uh, what do you have to... What safety standards do you have to comply with? What... Uh, do you have to disclose about how your system works? What, if it's a decision-making system, what um, does an individual have the ability to do and understand in relation to that system? But I do think um, in those contexts, and uh, I can't comment on the kind of social robots or in military applications, but definitely in the kind of decision-making contexts, that has been one of the really significant um, changes is that these are decision-making systems that are now uh, frequently designed by commercial entities. If I can take that question uh, just a little bit, bit further, there's an implicit part of this conversation that really what we're talking about is a first world problem. We're talking about robots really only being rolled out in developed economies. So are we fooling ourselves when we talk about the future of humanity in that most people on this planet will not uh, really have that much interaction with the robots that we're... So I would challenge you on that a little bit, which I think goes to the definition of what a robot is. Because, for example, if I think Facebook algorithms are themselves... You know, they are making certain decisions, they are interacting with humans in particular ways, they are automating particular interactions. Well, 
actually we've seen a much deeper impact from the decisions Facebook's made around the design of its algorithms in developing countries because they are test beds for changes to algorithms that cannot be undertaken in developed economies. And so quite often you'll see uh, for example, one of Facebook's really significant shifts recently, if we consider this in the context of a robot, was it trialled moving uh, media content to a separate news feed from personal content. So that when you signed into Facebook, you would see a feed that was just from information from your friends, and you would see a feed that was just information from the media. And they trialled that in developing countries. They trialled it in Sri Lanka, Cambodia, the Philippines, uh, and three or four other countries. And there are now researchers looking at the effects of those moves, because Facebook essentially controls access to information in those countries, who receives information and how they get it. Uh, the increase in uh, vigilante activism, the spread of fake news, because just because something comes from a friend does not necessarily mean it is any more reliable than something from a at least you know, credited a uh, new source, I, I don't know that it is the case that we are seeing, we, we might be seeing different kinds of robots, but we're also probably able to have uh, a discussion much more fully around accountability and regulation and safety from the benefit of economies that have had quite strong debatable, I know there's a debate being had right now about the strength of our public institutions, but we can have that debate where in a number of developing economies these systems are being trialled and they can be rolled out much more easily without that same scrutiny. Yeah, I, I think if anything, it, it's perhaps a more pressing problem for developing economies. I, I think it's a really important question. I was really pleased that the question was asked because it, it's not a new question. I mean, we've had this problem with pharmaceutical companies. Mm. Right, so it's an old problem, um, and it's the case of the, you know, with pharmaceutical companies, they're very properly regulated so that they don't produce drugs. They, there's not another thermidonide uh, problem that happens again. So we, we regulate so that doesn't happen. And we're discovering the power and reach of technology companies, and that is going to unfortunately require greater regulation. So just out of curiosity, um, because I going back to the commercialized robot and adop adoption rate, Question: um, How many of you actually use something like uh, AI speaker, like Amazon Echo or Google Home? So, so actually, a bunch of you, right? So in the US, like the Amazon Echo, so like 40 million units got sold. And I was just talking to Ellen before this <laughs> panel talk. But why wh I'm actually when I'm traveling abroad, away from home, I really miss my Amazon Echo. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so right. so <laughs> she'll be fine without you. Yeah. Uh, Miss she'll, she'll be just as keen to talk to you when you get home. Really? Yeah. <laughs> she'll not. Be. Um, so I, I own Amazon Echo, also Jibo, which is a robot version of this AI speaker. Um, I, I miss in the convenience of having those devices around, right? So actually, when we think about the adoption rate, because it totally like conveniences my morning routines and things like that. Um, so the adoption rate is actually adopting a robot in your home is already happening in a rapid pace. Um, the, the problem with our robots, because in the United States, there are so many startup companies that build these social robots as a product, trying to commercialize. Um, it's still a little very hard to, to justify the, the price gap between just an AI agent versus a physical embodied more like robot with like a character and personality. Um, because the hardware price doesn't it worry you though? There's a private company is listening into your so home so this is a, this is this is the right, the right point, right? Because now there wasn't any regulations around that, but companies started selling these, and then now the the privacy issue has been like hitting the articles more and more. And did it stop the adoption rate? Not really. It should it should have though? Yeah. But but why why do you think it's not? We should, because People, we because like there was this book. It was called 1984, and it was a, <laughs> the government, the government who you elect, so you do have some say about them, comes to listen in your home. Yeah. We're letting private companies with no oversight. Exactly. So that is no, actually that, not communicated. 2018, though. 1984 was sometime in our past, and I don't yeah. know if we learnt that lesson and moved on. But uh, my suggestion is get a dog. <laughs> 
my, then she can't my, leave my dog it. is neither <laughs> artificial and it's certainly not intelligent. I have a question from over here. Thank you. Um, so Toby mentioned that robots should never kill people, and that reminded me of um, you know the old Isaac Asimov's Three Rules of Robotics, which I think everyone's familiar with. Question for the panel is: Given all the discussion, do you think there should be a set of immutable laws of robotics that government should be imposing upon private companies as they start commercialising and in trade secret making decision making robots? Just what we need, more regulation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think GDPR is a really good example. Um, Sorry, can you... Sorry, what, what, what the acronym is? General, General Data, Data Protection Regulation. That the EU Commission has um, enforced, started enforcing as of this April, I think. Hey. So, so that's an interest. That's not what I would call um, laws of robotics, but it's laws of around people's interactions with systems and the collection of information about individuals as data. So, when I think of what I think of as laws of robotics in this context for commercial companies designing systems, I think of things like, well, how do what, what does safe mean? Mm -hmm. How do we? Hold, they're not kind of profound absolutes like a robot should never kill a person because I think, and this could be my legal background speaking, but it is very hard in legal terms to think in absolutes because there are always um, grey areas and there are always changes, uh, whether it's changes in technology. Or kill a person to save two people. Right. It's, you, there are always challenges, but we think of like, well, what are your guardrails? What are the... What are your um, rules of the road that you have to follow if you're going to play in this space? And how can we hold you accountable? The general data protection regulation is, does not really forbid much. People say that it does, but it actually, in terms of what it permits, it still allows the wholesale collection of personal data, the use of that data for a wide range of purposes. What it does change is your ability to engage with that collection of data and ask to see it, to request changes to it, and to understand when it's used to make decisions. And even then, the thing that I would say, and I, like, I talk usually about the GDPR in really positive ways in terms of um, what it does enable and is a step up, but I think there is a huge difference between what a set of laws in on paper allows you to do and your ability to access that in practice. And that is true of our interactions with many systems in our lives, is there is a big difference between, for example, a right in the GDPR that I can um, access and request changes to my data, and what that actually means in practice for my ability to do that. And, and that is something that we'll explore over many years to come. It only came into force in May. We'll there's already some test cases, I believe, coming up before the European Court of Justice around consents. So, you know, you know it changes the wording of consent, introduces freely given. So, um, what does that mean? What does that mean when we've all been ticking, <laughs> signing away our rights to anything using... And of course, we always read all of those. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, there's a lot to be the uncovered. Last word. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's see if we can get another couple of questions in before we wind up. Uh, Mike, too, I think it's your turn. Um, how do you suppose that we solve problems of money and unemployment when m large portions of the population cannot work and don't have a way to work? How do you suppose that the economic system goes around that. Yeah, Toby, describe this brave <laughs> new world. Oh, uh, this is a I think this is a really important conversation. We have. We have, mm -hmm. we have one good historical precedent, of course, which was the Industrial Revolution, where we changed the nature of work. It used to be all of you would be out in the fields working, for, if you were lucky, for some, some landowner, um, and we changed the nature of work. Now you all have jobs in offices and factories and, and, and do um, you know, other things now. But to manage that change, we changed the world in a big way. We introduced universal education, so you were educated for those new jobs. We introduced the welfare state, so if you were out of work, you weren't in the poorhouse. We introduced unions, labor laws, so that it wasn't just the owners of the, as Marx would have us believe, the owners of the factories that, that uh, re received all the benefits. So we made some pretty profound changes, and I think we have to think equally profound this time that um, maybe it's going to be 
universal basic income, or an income for everyone, ir irrespective of, of what um, they do. Maybe it is that we value all that work that I talked about before, all that housework, all that voluntary work, all that looking after the elderly, uh, the, uh, the, the handicapped, all that, all that work that we do in our community that we do value, but we never pay for. All right, I uh, think this may be our last question, mic number one. Yeah, um, yeah, so in your talk, you talked about, for example, how chess has helped amateurs and people like us to, you know, improve and enhance our skills. But, this, but at the same time, you know, when you have technology doing the work for you, for example, for a lawyer or deciding, taking some decisions or even doing household work, the increasing reliance on technology to do our work will sort of narrow down the, you know, the knowledge that we have as humans. And could that be a risk or a threat in future? And the second thing is, uh, will uh, as the popularity of AI grows into the future, and you talked about the 10 threats that we have to humanity, so does AI somehow contribute towards sustainability? For example, you have augmented reality that has certain ways that it can help you know, having a sustainable future, but what does AI have in line for that? You know, you build machines, uh, you design engines, you try to improve the, the e efficiency so that, you know, you, you can somehow improve the performance. But what's, what does AI have to contribute in this field? Okay, so one at a time. <laughs> Is uh, there the potential for the rollout of art, uh, AI to actually limit human experience? Go on, Ivan. Is it going to make us better humans? Um, I believe so. That is what we are striving for. Um, and that is why we need to build humanistic AI systems. AI systems that help us to become a person we aspire to be, right? Um, well, AI can be used for many, many things, but those are the domains that I'm very interested in um, and more people should be interested in. Um, so, for example, um, like, like robotic companion that I'm imagining that we'll be implementing and adopting to our homes. Um, the reason they need social intelligence is so that they actually understand our desires and help us become, like thrive in the, that direction, whether it's education, whether it's elder care, where it's um, he helping you stick to a medical regimen that, because humans have wills, right? <laughs> and that sometimes become an obstacle for you keeping good behaviors, right? But like we have phones right now that can we can push notifications on it, but is that is that effective? It's actually not very much. But when we actually compare it to a a physically embodied robot that is actually giving you these notifications in a personified manner, we see a greater outcome of these beneficial behaviors that people can actually achieve and acquire through the interaction with social agents. So that's my take on. I, I, I've said I think it's going to be the second renaissance, that we'll be have the time freed up for us to go off and, and do the things that are important to us, spend time with our families, create great art, uh, focus on the things that, that make us human. And, okay, we will be the last generation that knows how to read a map and to subtract, <laughs> but, but those are things that we can give up for the benefits that we get because we can spend time being human. Uh, we are already into overtime, so just very quickly, the second question there was around sustainability of this whole question of robots and uh, uh, systems that are augmented with robots. So, do we have a point there? Is, is it fully sustainable? So, so, I think it totally is system dependent. Some forms some forms of automation are showing demonstrated sustainability benefits. Um, for example, when we talk about autonomous vehicles, we're not talking usually about diesel or fuel guzzling autonomous vehicles. We're talking about the move to uh, electric vehicles to lower emissions. There are other uh, technical innovations that are being used for um, purposes associated with automation that are not so sustainable. So blockchain being the classic example where at the moment consumes huge amounts of energy. Uh, requires um, massive computing power in order to um, utilize. Uh, there are now, I know, in I, I visited some in China, some towns that have been like purpose built as massive mm -hmm. processing farms for blockchain. 
and that has huge environmental impacts. Um, and yet we kind of are still looking at, and, and they will have some benefits, distributed ledgers. It's more essentially just like with any other technical innovation, there are some things that we will use widely right now only to realize that they have high impact on the environment and cease use and move to something more energy efficient. And there are innovations that we're developing now that are precisely designed to improve sustainability. So I don't think it's an all or nothing. I right. think it uh, depends on your system. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, but I could carry on out here uh, for another hour at least. Uh, there's plenty to talk about. But unfortunately, to put it in the terms of one of my old colleagues at the ABC, that's your blooming lot, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> look, we wouldn't have had such a, an interesting and stimulating conversation if it wasn't for this magnificent panel. Let's hear it for Haywon, Toby and Ellen. There will be a book signing in the foyer immediately after this event. Go safely, ladies and gentlemen, and don't forget to get into Science Week. Thank you very much for coming along today.